Wow, you've already taken them. That's why, that's why you're so tired. Okay, well, I will try and keep you awake and happy and excited and for the next hour. I've already lost four minutes. Okay, next time we're going to move into wage, labor, and capital. You've already read it three times over the weekend, even though you were tired, Jessica. Uh-huh. uh-huh, good. That's why I'm tired. Ah, now that's a good answer. That's a good answer, yes. And so, actually, these are similar questions to last time, right, Simeon? Maybe, yes. What is wage labor? We might get there today, if we're lucky. What is labor power? Power. What is profit? And where does it come from? And what are the consequences of competition? It's a... It's you know, much easier to read Wage, Labor, and Capital. These pages, that's actually how many pages are there? It's only 14 pages. Um, but they're really fascinating pages. And encapsulated in them is the beginnings of Marx and Engels' theory of capitalism, which is really the soul, the, the heart and soul of their work, as I will suggest today. Okay, so, right. Summary. Summary, summary. Is this working? Yes, okay. Well, i got, I got about four points to make today. First point, history! I don't know why, how you two were taught history in schools, but I was taught it was a story of kings and queens. You know, I just had to memorize who lived, when, why, and how. And basically, it was all about kings and queens. We have a different notion of history when we do sociology. In Smith, the history of history has nothing to do with kings and queens, but it is the unfolding of the division of labor. The unfolding and increase, the unilinear increase of the division of labor. For Hegel, and you might say the younger Galen's, but for De Hegel, for sure, history is the unfolding of consciousness. It is human beings becoming more and more self-aware that they are human beings and that they are thinking human beings. It is the unfolding of human spirits. And for Marx and Engels, history is the, and we'll see there are many different notions of history, but the first notion that we're coming across is history as a succession of modes of production. And that's what we talked about at the end of last time, page 151 to 155, the succession of modes of production. And what is a mode of production? Well, we call it an MP, a mode of production. is how we produce. And it has two dimensions... Right? Called the f- f- forces of production. That's the who does what with whom and how. The way we produce things, the division of labor and specialization. And on the other hand, we have the relations of production. That's the who gets what from whom and how. That are the ownership relations, property relations, who gets the surplus. These are the two dimensions. Um, until that, this point, we've been calling this the division of labor. In a sense, the division of labor and mode of production are more or less identical expressions, though we're going to start using the word mode of production now instead of division of labor. And we're going to be talking about these two dimensions of the mode of production, the forces and relations. And these modes of production, the ancient, feudal, capitalist modes of production, are different modes of production, and we'll see that each mode of production has its own dynamics, its own pattern of change. Okay? So history is a succession of these modes of production. Matthew? Um, so, how is the mode of production? Ah, yeah, you might think so. But remember what I insisted. This is the Boroboy definition, the Boroboy reading of Marx and Engels. B-U-R-O-W-O-Y. Right. <laughs> it is to say that Smith had a dim- had division of labor was indeed the forces of production, specialization. And I said that Marx and Engels has two dimensions to the division of labor. The forces and also the relations. The who does what with whom, but also who gets what. The division of production and the division of the product. And I think there is a reading of Marx and Engels that suggests that. There is an alternative reading that says Marx and Engels sticks with sticks with, with the Smithian notion and just adds something completely different. I just want to talk about these two dimensions of the division of labor. I've said this about 50 times. Right? 50? Yeah. Right, Felipe? 50 times. Two dimensions of the division of labor. That's how we're going to understand it here. Okay. Any other questions? Good, 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 good. That was point number one. Point number, ooh, took four minutes. Point number two. Point number two. Well, we had a picture last time about other forces and relations of production as a succession. And I just like this because it puts both of the high, low development of the forces of production, high development of the forces of production. And then we have the relations of production, the who gets what, the ownership relations, property relations. And here we have private ownership. No, hold on, hold on. No, communal, right? Communal. Communal ownership of the means of production and the private ownership of the means of production. And then we had a two-by-two two table, a glorious two-by-two two table, in which here we had low development force, communal ownership. That's on the one side, essentially, is a classless, tribal society. And I suggested it's not really communal if it's a class society, but there is, but, but for Marx and Engels, there are different types of tribal societies. Some are classless, what we call primitive communism, and some are classful tribal society. And there, of course, they're talking about... There they're talking about the latent slavery in the family, appropriation of surplus 
from w- women and children by the patriarch. Tr- the class, so that's the class tribal society. And then we moved on to, let's get the arrow, let's go in the right direction. Um, we moved on to the ancient mode of production in which what? The classes are citizens and slaves. Citizens are the slaveholders and they, as citizens, have the right to own slaves. Ancient mode of production, then we have the feudal mode of production and there we have serfs and lords, lords and serfs. We're going to talk quite a bit about lords and serfs today. And then we over here we have capitalism. Here we are talking about high development of the forces of production. Capitalism, or the capitalist mode of production. And then finally, with communal ownership of the means of production, we have communism. Also high development of the forces of production. Now, as the course goes on, let me tell you, we're going to divide capitalism into two, and we're going to divide communism into two eventually by the end of the semester. So this picture is a very important picture, but we've only got so far, so far, so far. Okay, so that's my second point, and what happens is this history for Marx and Engels goes like this. Succession of modes of production. Good, very good. Now, that's my, now let me turn to my third point. Third point is communism. What is communism? Well, we ask the two questions. We ask the two questions. Who does what? Who gets what? Communism. Under who, under the, who gets what? Uh, yes, under the who gets what, we get who gets what. You might call those the relations of production. It's communal ownership, collective ownership. We collectively own the means of production that produce, that is the things, the factories, the organizations that produce things, we collectively own them, we plan society collectively, we decide what we will produce and who will produce it and when. It's a collective democratic decision making process. Collective ownership. Collective control. And down here, if we're in the German ideology, we have what? Well, who does what? And here we have the end of specialization. That's the hunting in the morning and criticizing in the afternoon and doing sociology in the evening. End of specialization. And Marx and Engels sometimes call this the voluntary division of labor, which is a paradoxical concept because division of labor for Marx and Engels implies specialization. The voluntary division of labor is the antithesis of specialization. It is the fact that we choose the varied occupations, varied um, tasks, varied, um, varied ways in which we use our different abilities and talents, a voluntary division of labor. This picture is the German ideology. Collective ownership of the means of production, collective control. So there is surplus, but it's centrally appropriated and then redistributed in a democratic fashion. And then there is the end of specialization, this romantic view of communism. What is missing, what is missing from this is how on earth we're going to produce the means of our existence. It is just not clear from this alone... um, How are we going to actually exist? Who's going to do the work that is alienating, estranging? Who's going to be producing the things that we need to consume? And so page 441, that magic page, there is an amendment. Now, I'm going to make an amendment to my interpretation of this amendment last time under serious pressure from your GSIs. Because they thought that they thought it would be a better way of doing this is to say this voluntary division of labor actually, when it comes to page 41, has two dimensions. And those two dimensions are the realm of freedom, where people really do develop their rich and varied abilities in community with others, and the realm of necessity. This is the amendment that is made on page 441 to this original romantic view of communism in the German ideology. The collective ownership remains the same, but now we have these two dimensions, the realm of freedom and the realm of necessity. Realm of freedom is where we develop our rich and varied abilities. The realm of necessity is the realm of associate, <coughs> associated producers. So what does that mean? Well, we're not sure. Marx and Engels don't exactly tell us, but we have some idea in where, um, of some sort of cooperative, collective organization of work. Go and see this film. What's it called again? Take? The Take. The Take. It's all about one particular way in which in Argentina, workers took over the factories and ran them themselves. So there's an idea of associated producers. This was about three or four years ago, right? So, yes, so, all right, associated <coughs> producers, and we talked about how this realm of necessity under communism will involve producing things that we need, but what will happen, what will happen is that the 
will be much less waste, much less waste. We will produce fewer wasteful goods. We will therefore be able to spend less time. We will spend less time in the realm of necessity because we pr- will produce less wasteful goods. And also because <coughs> we'll get rid of all sorts of control mechanisms in production that exist because we live in a class society at the moment. So that's the idea. That is the idea. Yes. So let me emphasize this page 441 is an amendment to the German ideology, giving it a little more sense of realism. For you, it may still be unrealistic, but this is at least more realistic. Any questions? (coughs) You again. Very good. Um, I'm just, uh, in regards to communism about the probation and the probation, I don't think because you said that it was on the last lecture, I believe you said that everything was appropriated and redistributed, but then I asked my GSI and he said surplus, but not everything, so. (laughs) (laughs) Who's your GSI? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No. We're both true, of course. In practice, what happens, I think, is that everything is centrally appropriated and redistributed. But what is crucial is that there is no surplus that is centrally appropriated and possessed by a class. So, it's both true. I think, in practice, what will happen is that actual physical goods that we will decide collectively in a society, not clear what scale, as we talked about that last time, not clear what scale, but we'll decide collectively what will be produced. They will be some, put in a warehouse and from there redistributed, in a sense. Um, but the crucial theoretical point, that's the practicals, the theoretical point is that surplus is not monopolized by a, a particular group, class, but is redistributed. So, as ever, I and GSIs entirely agree. We just have a slightly different slant on matters. Yes, but they're basically saying the same thing. It is crucial that there not be classes under communism, and therefore there is not any central appropriation of surplus owned by a specific class. And of course, that's what happened under communism. What happened not under communism, what happened in the Soviet Union, was a class began to appropriate the surplus to itself. And what was that class? Bureaucracy. Hand up, Jason, you Trotskyist. Bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. What is a bureaucracy? <laughs> I wouldn't call it a class. But what, not, hey, just, just, what is a bureaucracy? Don't say what it isn't. What is a bureaucracy? What do you mean? People who have special privileges and are at more have largely greater influence than the majority of others uh-huh. in determining policy. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Casey? The people running the government. The people running the government. Yeah, that might be a good definition in this particular case. I mean, it's more than that, probably. But in the, in the Soviet Union, there was a party, a communist party, that essentially controlled the state. And the state and the party and the, what we'll call the apparatchiki, i.e. the members of the party, really appropriated the surplus and kept a lot of it for themselves. So um, what there did emerge was something you don't like, class, something like a class in which surplus was centrally appropriated and not redistributed, but consumed centrally. So yes, I think that's... And it was, they were not democratically accountable to the rest of society. Yeah, so that's what happened. And of course, as I said last time, when we look at the conditions, when we look at the conditions for communism, we find that they were never applicable in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was essentially a peasant society. China was a peasant society. Cuba was a largely peasant society. Well, a little lesser, but largely peasant society too. So places where we associate so- socialist revolutions were places where, in fact, interestingly enough, the forces of production were undeveloped or relatively undeveloped, and therefore socialism, according to Marx and Engels, could never have survived because the forces of production, because the capacity to transform nature, the development of the economy was so limited. So, it is one of those strange things, and we'll see why <clears throat> that Marx and Engels anticipated revolutions happening in the most advanced countries. They turn out to happen in more backward countries. I saw a hand here. Are you a Lauren? Heather. Jesus. I don't know you then, do I? No. Heather, okay. So if it didn't work in those countries because they weren't developed enough, in order for communism to work, the whole world has to be in on it. So is communism even remotely viable? Is there something else? Well, I mean, uh, yes, because this has to be a worldwide phenomenon, it sounds even more implausible than when just reading the German ideology. The idea, I think, is that a revolution happens in one country and it triggers revolutions everywhere. So there is a sort of domino effect around the world. That, I think, is the imagination. And that is what the Bolsheviks, who staged the Russian Revolution, Lenin, Trotsky, Bukharin, and others, they all hoped that the Russian Revolution would trigger revolutions in the West. It did not. It did the opposite. It created a reaction against it. But I think that's how it would work. The revolution, when the world is ready... And we may be just on the brink. When the, when the world is ready, then a domino effect. We'll see that we are not really ready. There's a crucial ingredient. And still, well, look, even, even, look, even from reading the German ideology, there's a crucial ingredient. Suppose we are living in a world now where the forces of production are sufficiently developed. There's one crucial ingredient that does not seem to be present in the world today. That if, if, if the capitalism enters this period of major catastrophe and crisis, this absent element will 
make it very difficult for us to make a transition to a society beyond capitalism. What's that missing element? 